Hello, Anton. Hello, Sergey, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. How about yourself? Yes, I can hear you too. Uh, I just want to turn up the volume of uh, just a second, please. Yeah, thank absolutely. Right, Sergey, I will introduce you to the class in a moment. Uh, can you first tell us uh, the, the time there? It's now 5.30 in the morning, is it? Yeah, you were right. I had a hard time figuring it out. <laughs> okay. I must say you look really fresh. And, uh, uh, did you go to bed at all? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm fine. That's when most America, I guess, wakes up around this time and drives to work right now. Okay, good. I remember last time um, when I called you, I, I got you still in bed because we made a mistake with the, with the time, remember? <laughs> that, uh, that's how I sleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Um, Great to see you. Yeah, it's absolutely good to see you. It's, it's been about six months since we last talked. Yeah, pretty much. Well, well, doing this in class. So, um, I will at the moment I'll move away and I'll show you the class. We've got about 14, 15 students here, all doing their master's um, degree, entrepreneurship and innovation. And um, tonight we've talked about structuring organizations and making sure that they to, to make sure they act entrepreneurially and do innovation and that sort of thing. And I told them about, um, about my friend, about you, and that you came up with this idea of feararchy. And um, I think everybody is really interested to hear what, what exactly it means. And more importantly, what can we do to, to sort of get rid of it? Because it's a really nasty thing. So I hope um, in the next hour or so you can... Uh, tell us more about it, Sergey. Um, yes, so by means of introduction, Sergey Ivanov is a, is a professor in, at the District University of Columbia in Washington, D.C. And you've been there now for how many years, Sergey? I think three, somewhere three, four. Enough three, four years. years. Right. So, so uh, just a little bit of background to, to the class. Um, you and I met at some stage in Malaysia, if I remember correctly. That's right. That's right. right. We, we both attended a conference, and I just told him that I attended another conference that was really boring, uh, but I, I managed to stay inside. I didn't get, go out, but in on that case, in Malaysia, I, I went out and I sat in the garden, and, and Sergey also, he couldn't stand it anymore, and he went out and we started talking there, and yeah, since then, we've, be, we've become friends. And, and I really appreciated that you're always willing to talk to the students, Sergey, so... Um, Without much further ado, let's let's hand over to you. Uh, I'll just is it okay? I'll just I'll just try to to make the volume a bit louder. Yeah. Um. Damn, where, where should I go? Andrea, where should I go? Um, this is the button on the top. Um, on the key. Yep. Oh yes, of course. Yeah. Okay, Sergey, can can you talk again? Let yeah. Um, yeah. Um, oh, much better. Okay, okay, wonderful. So I'll move away and I'll just show you the people in the class. Okay, can can you see them? Uh, just um, just not, not very well. He All right, now I can see you. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that's, that's, that's really wonderful. Uh, I guess good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So it, it's fairly early here, but I'm really always excited and uh, uh, delighted to talk to Dr. Deval students, and we've been doing that for a number of years now. And I'm uh, very gl uh, glad to... Uh, so, Anton, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, Anton didn't tell you. It's actually with uh, two of us who went into that conference where we met. It was uh, Dr. Alex Maritz, who is at your school, and Anton. Well, <coughs> Alex was experienced once, so he left, and uh, Anton and I were stuck there in Malaysia for quite a long time. They drove us into a into location we couldn't escape. And, and what happened at that conference, they had a couple of interesting... Uh, uh, keynote speakers and uh, I was very impressed with one of them and as the conference got really boring um, 
I tried to escape, but there was no way to uh, to leave, and there was uh, somebody standing uh, in a garden smoking, and I came up and said how great the keynote speaker was, and that was the keynote speaker. So that's how Anton and I uh, met. Well, before we begin, uh, let me, um, guys, ask you if you have any questions, and maybe tell me a little bit uh, who you are. What I thought I'll deviate from a format. I have a couple of PowerPoints, but I don't want to bore you to death. So perhaps if you have questions, I'll answer them, and then I'll draw pictures, and we'll sort of go uh, from there. Okay, so, so you're looking for the first question, do you? Yeah, uh, or just maybe um, tell me a couple of questions and then we'll sort of, uh, I'll try to answer them. Uh, so anything you guys like. Okay, sure. So what, what is Firaki? Um, so, so Dan wants to know what, 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 what do you mean by Firaki? How do you define it? Okay, uh, mm -hmm. let me see if I can write those down. Um, and uh, can you uh, right now see me? Yes, we can still see you. Yep. And you should see the uh, the yellow whiteboard, right? I'm wondering. No, no we don't see a uh, we don't see a whiteboard. Hmm. I, it's like a yellow. Whiteboard. Can you uh, all see it or not? No. No. Oh, okay. So the file sharing is not working. No, not not so far. Uh, you I've got it. You got to click something on yours. Uh, ah, yeah, you just hide right? your menu, perhaps. Do I have to? If you hide your menu, you might be able to see down the bottom. Is it that plus thing? That plus, and then some options would come up. Yeah, I just did that, and. Share screen? No. <coughs> no, Anton. I... Are you using Apple or Windows? Apple. Apple. Okay. Yeah, it worked on. I, I tested it on the Windows, so you cannot see anything. No. Let me no. try it one more time, and if not, I'll just. Um... Oh, yeah, I'm trying to do sharing on my, um, on my side. Okay, maybe while you're busy, Sergey, can I can I have some more questions? Uh, yeah, here. yeah, go okay. ahead. Anybody got more questions that I can list here? Ooh. Yeah, we got it. Okay, we've got it. What is Firaki? Thank you. Any other question? Swiss face more these uh, phenomenal more. Okay. Firaki, do, do you find it more in certain industries than in others? That's the second question. Okay. That's an interesting one. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm basically what I'm trying to do is I'm writing them down. And I've shared a um, whiteboard, but for some reason, for, I guess you guys cannot see it, which is... Oh, well. It came up, but now it's gone again. So, it's oh, so you did, did you did you see a yellow thing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we did. And now it's gone, right? Yeah. Now it's just black. It was that one. We it? can yeah. see yeah, your cursor. Yes. Yeah, now we got it. Okay, so now you can see it. Yes. Okay, perfect. So that 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 works. How do you overcome it? How do you overcome the fear of phenomenon? Come. Yeah. How do you overcome it? Okay. Okay. This is an interesting survey. Here's a, here's a question. Um, uh, is the Firaki principle the, the, the same strength in the, at the top of the hierarchy and at the bottom of the hierarchy? Something like that? Yeah. Yep. I don't understand the question, but. Uh, is it at the uh, hierarchy at top or the bottom of the organization? Yes. Is it stronger there than, than <coughs> the big is it uh, Okay, great uh, question. Okay. Um. Okay, I will adjust those. And if you can see it, what I can do, I'm trying out this new product. And I'll basically try to draw the answers. I think it's a little bit more lively than uh, a static PowerPoint. Uh, go ahead. And do you like clicking that one? It's just blocking 
Okay. okay. So, uh, which one? Just uh, that little message that's popped up. Just close. Yeah. This one. No. And can uh, you see it on the white? Uh, it, is it big enough for all of you to see? Yes. Yep. yes. Okay. Yep. Wonderful. Any more questions? Is Good one. Is Firaki cultural, culturally related? Okay. That's a great question. Um, okay, so let's uh, let me try to save those and uh, we'll start with those five questions. And Good. what I'm trying to do, I'm copying them into the uh, PowerPoint that I can then. Uh, later, give that to you. Okay. So, so I'll go. Uh, I'll answer the first question. Uh, what is a fear are here? <laughs> I started my organizational study probably about fifteen years ago, and uh, I had a deep interest in. Uh, understanding how all of organizations are uh, worked and so what I tried to do I traveled worldwide and visited small and large organizations alike conducting uh, organizational studies using a certain uh, uh, methods I'm not sure how familiar you with um, uh, different organizational theorists and uh, at the beginning what I couldn't figure out is how all organizations work large and multinational organizations a small organization and so on. And so in the process, I've uh, met, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Elliot Jux. Uh, uh, he's, uh, have you heard of uh, Edward Deming? Yes. Okay. Quality, quality guy? Yeah, the yeah. quality guy. Anybody uh, of the students you guys know? No? All right. So this is the th two grades of management. And uh, I started uh, asking uh, w what uh, shocked me in, in organization is what percent of fear I have found in most organizations worldwide. Well, you guys have a notepad, um, um, right? Uh, so write down, and I, as I understand, most of you are working right now full time or part time. Yeah. yeah. How much fear is in your organization right now on a scale between uh, zero to a hundred percent? So zero, no fear, a hundred percent. That's a complete and uh, total paranoia. So, so everybody must write it down, right? Yeah, let's let let's okay. play play with that. It's in your in your companies. Yeah. And it's just a good case, right? Pretty much right from your from your point of view. So when you go in, you can you you can sense how fearful the organization is. If you Look at the very fearful organizations. People are, people don't talk to each other. You see high levels of stress. They hide. You walk in a the hallway. They run away. So in your organization, you know what the percent of fear is. So you guys all, all got the answers? Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. What, what, what do you have? Somebody wrote 120%. But that's not possible, right? No, never mind. Okay, 120. What else do you have? 14, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40
Uh, um, is that a zero? Yeah, that's a zero. I, I do like this. Uh, right. Yeah. I don't think people have much fear. Uh, am I correct? Depends on what you talk about. If you talk about losing them, um, then there's half fear. No, just right. your fear of your wife or your husband or your oh. children <laughs> or your mother. All of them? It's a fear of losing yourself. Yeah. Not yeah. of loss, but just a general fear. No, is it correct? Yeah. yeah. Anybody is afraid of your spouse or date? Or? <laughs> I, I get worried about my siblings all the time, and that's a issue. That's. I get worried. That's about probably not what he's talking. Okay. About. Yeah, f uh, it, 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 it's fearing direct <laughs> consequences from that person. Is that correct, Sora? But how many of you fear your mother? No. Okay, this is a sort of silly, oh, your children, this is a sort of silly question. So what you find is, you find a dichotomy. Uh, in, in good families, you generally will find 0% of fear. If you go into an organization, you will find staggering amounts of fear. And what I've discovered, it's irrelevant how much fear the organization has. So the numbers, let's say 10% and 120% and are exactly the same, which means uh, that the organization is in a complete paralysis. Um, and so I started calling this type of an organization a fear here. Uh, it means that uh, nothing productive can be achieved in this entire organization. Um, let me sort of let me save this slide. What I'll do is I'll let um, I'm saving those slides because and then I'll uh, h hand them over to you. Okay. Okay. So did you say nothing productive can happen because of, of this amount of fear that exists? Correct. At a high level? At any level. Uh, let, let me go. These are sort of a little bit outrageous claims, but um, it, it is um, sort of what it is. So let me... Yeah, in school we have a way to... Uh, go to next slides here we do not so let me ask you then what is the fundamental function of the organization publishing publishing yeah it's the fundamental the function of the organization, organization. Yes. Books. Pu publishing what books books that's a very specific organization. Yeah, that, is that what he's asking? So he's asking. Oh, no. Uh, what general? is the function of all organizations? So what's a fu what is the fundamental function of any organization? Producing okay. goods to sell. Yes. For profit. Okay. To, to add value. Well, not necessarily for profit, but yeah, to add value. To add value and sort of be profitable in a way so they can sustain themselves. Add value. Provide a service. Provide a service. Serve humanity. Yeah. Solve problems. Solve problems. Sorry. Look, look after its people. Okay. Grow. Okay. Um. Let me give you uh, an idea with all of those that the fundamental function of the organization is one and only one, and it's to innovate. And you guys thought I was biased. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> to innovate, okay? Uh, and it's the only one that exists for all organizations. The, fun the second function is to improve. And what innovate is, and I don't have space here, is new products or services and then improve current products and current services but the fundamental function of all organization is to innovate if you don't innovate you don't have a future that uh, so, sort of makes sense for any organization worldwide um, now, the argument that I'm making with uh, hierarchies, well, I'll just poll you. How innovative is your organization? Uh, 
How much it, innovation it, is happening it, in your current organization? Let's say on a scale of zero, there is nothing going on to a hundred percent. You're innovative as um, the world's leading companies combined. Google, Apple. Okay, you want us to write again quickly? Thirty. Thirty. IT? 50. 50? 40. 60. 60. In my department, 30. 30. 30. Okay, so somewhere around there. And I assume you're all uh, is a senior or mid level managers. Is, am I about right? So, some, yes. Some. Some are. Uh, can I? Uh, I'll be. Can, and it's really early over here, and I'm not thinking very clearly, so I apologize for that. But I'll give you a little bit of hard data. That's fine. Have a, May have I a suggest <laughs> that this, the, the rate of innovation in your companies is at about zero? Or at least yeah. in most companies? You are going to explain it, what, <laughs> what you are saying, right? Right. If I go in and and I can even go go in, um, there is no innovation that's happening in your organizations today. Uh, it's your, uh, if if you go ask Google, uh, there was an interesting talk recently by uh, Larry Page, and he was asked how much is there at Google, and at Google he saying he thinks. Uh, that there is 1% of innovation of what they can achieve. So if Google is innovating at 1% of what they can achieve, those numbers that you've given me uh, is absolutely impossible. Okay. Furthermore, uh, the amount of fear in your organization demonstrates that uh, the conclusion that I'm coming in on, um, is that you absolutely have 0% of innovation in a fear are here. Uh, are there any athletes in a uh, in a class? People who played, let's say, the professional or sports at a high level. No, no, no. No, uh, no sports ever. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> but not professional. <laughs> not professional. Uh, what did you play then? I played a lot of tennis. Okay. Tennis. Tennis. So if when you played tennis, and uh, how, how, what is your rating? Like, four, professional, four point oh. Okay, so you're pretty good. Um, when you have a tennis match, if you're if you're afraid, if you have fear, how well are you going to do? Uh, drop down to like sixty percent of your capability. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, working uh, not least uh, with athletes, with athletes, what I'm observing is if you have any percent of fear, it's you're pretty much uh, what what you do. Your body. Um, uh, you have high level of stress, you can't relax, you become very slow and you can't perform. And so what you're telling me with the amount of fear, for example, 10%, 90%, 80%, is how good your defense mechanism is against fear, nothing else. But the percent of fear in the, in the organization is about, is always, uh, I'll put it at about 100%. Okay, and it's over here, you trying to push that fear away. So that, does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let uh, um, let me save this and um, while I'm saving this, let me ask you a question. What is the percent of waste in in organizations today or in your organization? Let's say percent between doing productive work versus simply wasting resources and energy into unproductive activities. 20 percent. You know, sole purpose is to be innovative and we're at 0% and we're 100% waste. Okay, so Lisa, did you hear that? Yes, that was a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> what else? You, you, you said 20, that's quite low. 20% waste? Yeah. That, yeah. I'm just thinking about time and I'm thinking about goods produced in my industry that don't sell. Get, get people that say 20%. Okay. I think about 80. 80? 80, 80, 80, 20. Yeah. Process bureaucratic processes. Yeah. The waste? Waste, 80. yes. Yeah, 80. So 80%? 80, there's a few 80s here. 120. 
Oh, so, twenty uh, percent. I heard too, right? Yes, twenty percent. Uh, uh, let me go into the uh, waste in organizations. If you look at coal production of energy, and I, uh, and I think you guys actually Rio Tinto uh, uh, excavate uh, coal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In coal production, what is the percent of uh, when you pr uh, uh, obtain coal? What is the percent of waste versus useful energy that is derived from coal? What would be your guess? Twenty percent. Uh, twenty percent of waste. Ninety no, percent waste. Ninety yeah. percent waste. Waste. Uh, and what's your name? Sean. Sean, yeah, actually, absolutely correct. Um, Nikola Tesla, I don't know if you. Yes. Uh, writing on coal production and asks, uh, what's the greatest waste of energy? He thinks that uh, we're at about 90% of waste and 90 to 98% of waste and 10% is actually um, uh, is actually going into the energy. So what within our organization, what I'm finding is that about uh, the numbers are about uh, approximately alike. It was interesting. My mm -hmm. colleagues have been doing this research, and what they first now found is um, the topic is waste in organization. It's about 50-50. So our organization wastes about 50% of all of the investments and resources that go into them. Uh, starting doing organizational studies, I was coming to about 60%, but now I'm more and more convinced that uh, what about Nikola Tesla's findings, that about 10% uh, in organization going towards useful activities and 90% is a total in waste. Um, what are some of the wasteful processes in your organizations? Human resources. Procedures. <laughs> Procedures. Approvals. 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 Meetings. Meetings. Materials. Raw materials. Long processing times. I'm sorry, okay. appraisals? Middle management. Uh, Performance sorry. appraisals? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Middle management? No authority. Okay. Um, yeah, so. Uh, Hawking assignments? <laughs> which ones? That, that, that's okay. Marking assignments. <laughs> Marking assignments. That's so useful, I actually. Say writing assignments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, 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 let me save those. Um. Um, so that's where we are I, uh, with organizations. And so the topic of um, um, so so then within an organization, what you have we have is an interesting paradox. So um, within an organization, if the function of the organization is to innovate. You cannot do that at any level of the organization, um, while at the same time all of the resources that we are putting in, in our modern uh, 21st century uh, society, are, are going into waste. So that's uh, um, the topic. Uh, that Now there is another interesting paradox within the innovation, that if you wanted to achieve greatness, uh, you need to have a large amount of people uh, working towards that particular goal. For example, putting a man uh, on the moon or uh, launching a satellite towards Mars. So any large uh, sort of uh, 
Does make sense? Yeah, sure. Uh, so you have many, so lots of people are working together towards a, a goal. So I'll put hundreds, and, hundreds and thousands of people together in some kind of a shape or form in an organization. Okay, in order to achieve large-scale innovation. We don't see your drawings, I see. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, can you see that now? Yes. yes. Okay, so the function of the organization is to innovate. You need to have lots of people working towards that particular goal. Now, at the same time, within the organization, as soon as you... Uh, what at least I've discovered... Uh, as soon as you get into the hierarchical structure, let me ask you a question. Is it possible to innovate in a hierarchy? People say yes. So let me. But, but we guess by now that it's not. It's, it's more difficult. Yes. Huh? Yeah, so is it possible? Let's say yes and no. Let's, uh, what are your thoughts? Yes. Is there anybody that say no? It's possible, but it's very slow. Possible, but slow. Okay. Depends on the managers. Depends on. Okay, so yes. Depends on who the managers are. Yes. Strategy. And the strategy? Depends. Uh, anybody who says no? Uh, nobody says no, it seems. So it's yes, right? Um, so what I'm finding that there's a sort of a lot of paradoxes that is absolutely not possible to innovate in any hierarchy. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, we're cheating ourselves. We're sort of smoking something and believing it and thinking that it's possible. But as soon as you get into this particular structure, you're done. Innovation ceases. Okay. Now, again, you can disagree with me. I'm just sort of sharing those findings. Um, the innovation, uh, what, what I'm discovering, can only come out out of... Um, let me see if I can save it here. Out of a peer relationship. Ah. <laughs> no, I think the lights are off. We, we are still here, okay? Oh, you're the, okay. Just the lights go off by themselves. But, but we, we can... Yeah, 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 thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay, I can... I'll save it. Uh, And let me just save this. Uh, uh, what, what, yeah, this board is not that good. And, uh, okay. So, no innovation in the history of humanity, from what I can see, has ever come from a hierarchical structure. Name one of the innovations today that sort of are changing the world. Smartphones. Smartphones. Okay. And uh, who were some of the innovators? Not all, but just a, a few. Uh, People-wise. Companies don't invent. People do. People-wise. I think research comes from a hierarchical structure. Well, you're looking at, at Edison and people like that? Okay, so yeah. So let's, let's just name a couple of people who are coming up with great ideas which, which change the world. Steve Jobs? Yep. Edison, Ford, Henry Ford, Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg. Uh, Tesla. I'll put with Edison since Anton, you put Edison. I have to put Tesla. Right. <laughs> sure. Any more? Today in Australia. Oh, today. Okay. The 
Australia. Or in the world. Uh, and Andrew Bird is an Australian. Okay, I don't know how to spell it. It's why? B I R T. B B I R T. Yeah, Andrew Bird. Okay. Cochlear implant. What's his name? Isn't that the professor? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow, it's Australian. Yeah. Uh, so, so let's take a look at this. Let's say five people. Uh, how many of them are employees of a of a higher of an organization? So when you go into yes, that's what you're gonna say. <laughs> so are you gonna say? So are you saying that innovation? I mean, this course we're learning that innovation comes from various different in different ways. In degree. In operations in in, um, in in a whole lot of segments that you can find within business. It doesn't have to be you know innovating to come up with an idea that changes the world. Any so, right, that's correct. Any innovation, you're absolutely correct. Any smaller product uh, on a smaller market in a local market, uh, people who are coming up with great and uh, with innovative ideas. Uh, it's easier to put Steve Jobs because um, everybody knows him, but it's an easy example to discuss. But all of you, are, how many of you work for a company? So, okay, so you, you have a boss, right? Um, anybody does not have a boss? Okay, then what? what you're not you, you own the company? Oh, yes, <laughs> forgot about that boss, the big boss. <laughs> so you are the CEO? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And how big is the company? It's involved in a startup, right? Involved in a startup. Yeah. Okay, yeah. it's a startup. I'm, gl I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, so you're a partner in the company? I'm, I'm what? A partner? Partner. No, I'm, I'm the CEO. I'm the You're founder. the CEO. Okay. So I'll I'll add you. I don't know your last name, but may I put you right over here? Yep. <laughs> Dan. Yeah. Good, good okay. company. So for the for the rest of the um uh, uh, for you. So when you go into the hierarchical organization. Um, So you work in a particular role and you have a boss. Is it a, is it a factual statement? Yes. Okay, for most people, when we go to work, there is a boss, boss assigns tasks. Now, let me ask you for Steve Jobs. Does Steve Jobs have a boss? No. Okay, uh, yeah, or any of those people above? He's a shareholder. The, the right? shareholder, the boss, yeah. He's accountable to the chairman. Yeah, the chairman and the... Steve Jobs, uh, so how many of you own shares of stock? Yes. Of Apple. Did you call Steve Jobs and tell him what to do? <laughs> no. Oh, another no. one is today is uh, very famous, at least in the United States, is Elon Musk, the, uh, who started a Tesla company, uh, airspace company, and a lot of other companies. If you own a share of, let's say, Pi PayPal, can you call... Uh, Elon Musk and tell him what to do? No. No. Okay. So what those people were, what you're finding, that innovation can only come from people who are not within the manager subordinate relationship within an organization. This is the only people who can actually think of their own independent ideas. And what is interesting is coming up that great innovation comes up, uh, for example, uh, those three, uh, Edison, Ford, and Tesla, were contemporaries, and they all knew each other, but they were not working for each other. So Tesla wasn't working for Edison, and vice versa. Okay. Um, okay. So the question, the, the great question today, uh, at least, um, remains is, how can you aggregate hundreds of thousands of people uh, into what we call a hierarchy, but also how you make this company innovative. And we have no answer to that right now. So as soon as you go into the hierarchy, we're done with innovating. Okay. If you don't believe me, I always tell at least some of my students or colleagues to put the grand idea and uh, go and tell your boss. 
in an organization and then call me and let me know how it works out. <laughs> okay, especially if that idea is threatening to the company's current state of operations. Uh, I have a couple of answers. I, I, I'm not going to go into that right now, but there is. And a few people who have figured it out, some of the answers were, um, well, I'll put those two. It was uh, Edward Deming and Elliot Jacks. So those two uh, sort of uh, came up with a set of plausible organizational processes that at least uh, may allow possibly for the innovation to occur. And all of those, of course, were thrown out and forgotten. How many of you are studying Deming or Jacques today? <coughs> all right, but, okay, so did I answer sort of the question about the hierarchy and what it is and why it's important? <coughs> uh, so, okay, can you perhaps just very quickly say what, what is it that people actually fear within those fear of these? What, what do they fear? What's going to happen? What do you fear? When, what, what, when you said that, um, let, let's talk about it. Now let me save this one. Do they fear failing or do they fear what the boss is going to do? Do they fear losing their jobs? Or Okay. Yes, uh, great. When, when um, Steve, so Steve Jobs you know, invented a whole heap of things, no. and Apple presumably is a hierarchy. So, is the assumption in this work that Steve Jobs is the only one that was innovating in Apple? Good question. Uh, I don't know if you heard that, Sergey. I think the answer is yes. I, if I understood your answer, is Steve Jobs the only one who can come up with innovation? Is that what? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. he ran a hierarchy. Correct. So Dan can come up with new ideas, but if uh, somebody works for Dan, it will be very difficult for them to come up with goal ideas unless Dan implements certain organizational procedures within the company and builds it to welcome innovation within the company. <laughs> And um, we can explore that at, uh, well, maybe even uh, later today. So it is possible, and uh, but it's unachievable within today's organizations. So let me answer Anton's question, and let, uh, I'll tell you why it's unachievable, and then give you a couple of organizations. Um, so what do people fear when you said 120 percent fear? What did what what did what was the fear? Are you asking? Yeah, the class. So What's one was certainly <laughs> uh, security. What else? Yeah, I made a joke. Yeah. Um, so, so what, what, can I ask the class? What did you? What were the few factors? If so? I think um, we're all we're all people getting, getting judged, judged, um, and false bell curves and things of that nature. Where it doesn't matter how well your organisation is performing. Someone's always going to be here, right at the bottom. Okay. Um, and so wh what, what's, what's your name? Sean. Uh, Joe? Sean. Uh, Sean. 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 Uh, sorry. Sean, you're absolutely, absolutely correct. That's a major fear in most organizations. Um, I don't know how you... How did you know this? It happens. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Let me ask. Let, let me uh, go in depth into your question. Uh, and we're being judged with performance appraisals. Am I going about the right way? Yes. Let me ask you a question. What can a person do, an employee do, to improve the quality of his or her own work? I want to explore your question because it's a very big one. Depends on their role. Depends on their role, but say it's a sales role, it's better better results. So, and strong yes. relationships. so what can so, an employee do to improve the quality? So um, we, we measure on two things, one on, one on their, their behaviours and the other on their performance. Uh, so one's factually driven, the other's driven by what everybody else thinks of you essentially. Well, let's, let's deviate from your, uh, from your example. Just in general, what can an employee do? Can, what can 
uh, let's say your professor do to improve the quality of his work? Professional development of some sort. Professional development. What else? Try harder. Try harder. Work longer. More effort. I'm sorry. Work longer. Hours get help. Do things the boss's way. I'm sorry. Do, do the <laughs> boss's do, way. Do things the boss's so, way. That's that's a, that that's a high. That you will be promoted. Alright. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, do boss's way. I can't hear it here. You know, it's impossible to do boss's way if your boss is not competent. Yeah. Uh, it's it, 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 it's a it's an unwinning paradigm. But just little things, little qualities that you know that they love, <coughs> just do it for them. You should give me a lecture here. Very good. Make, make them, <laughs> what you say is make them look good as well. Well, yeah, um, look good. Yeah. Let, me, let me see with this example. How many of you ever eaten in a restaurant? I'll come back to this. Yes. <laughs> so what can a chef do? What can, what can a chef, chef do, do to improve the quality of food? Cook your steak the right way. I'm sorry? Cook your steak the right way. Cook uh -huh. fast. Buy better produce. Cook, cook good, okay. What else? L listen to the customer and do what they what they're asking, what they want. Yeah. How they want it. Do some research. Recipe research. Okay. Source better um, produce. Ah, okay. So produce, so I put ingredients. Yeah. Right? Better quality ingredients. What else? I'll create new recipes. <laughs> create new recipes. Okay, new recipe. There was a also a good one, cook with, with love. What else? Not poison you. Not poison you, okay. <laughs> I didn't miss you. <laughs> uh, how about better equipment? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Faster service, maybe. Okay, so... So l l let's go through that. Uh, let let's start with that. So better pro better produce in ingredients. Um, who is responsible for getting a high uh, good quality produce or ingredients? Depends on the size of the owner, or it could be the chef. So uh, let's let, let's talk about not the chef who is the owner, but chef who works for an owner. Okay. So who is responsible for getting new ingredients? Can chef go in and just say it changed suppliers? No. So who would be responsible? The manager. The management. In this case, uh, the owner. Who is responsible? Can cook introduce new recipes? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Just come up and say, it. from Chinese we're going to be coming uh, uh, cook uh, Russian food. No, uh, <laughs> the manager must approve. Okay. okay. Depends on the manager. So if the manager is very trusting and he's a good leader. Would he need approval? Yes. Usually. Always. Yes. Um, equipment. Uh, who is responsible for getting the the can, the chef, can chef go in and just buy and replace all of the new equipment? Uh, who, is re who is responsible for research of new recipes? Let's say research and you can put training. The chef. Uh, when? So chef goes to work, 
let's say, I'm not sure what the hours are, but I think it's about 6 a.m., if not 5 a.m., until, let's say, 6 to 6. When should uh, the chef research? I think there's a lot of chefs in Australia that that's their responsibility, is to create the menu that comes as part of their resume, sort of thing. Job description. Job description. So why, should, why should they do that? <coughs> is it part of their job or is it, should they do it in their off time? It's part of their job. Yeah. And if it's part of their job, who, who builds into that? So how, how would you make it part of their job? So on Friday, 2 to 6, you research recipes? Between breakfast and lunch, between lunch and dinner. <laughs> okay, so, so wh while someone's delivering the food, I have to log off and log in to the, go to Google and explore recipes? It, it's probably something they do over weekends in their own time. Yeah. Oh, probably. so on Saturday and Sunday to do it on your own time? Yeah. Well, when there's a seasonal produce, they've got to create things with it as well, in some instance. Like well, what, I, what, what I'm hitting is, it's... Uh, would you agree with me that it's management who built in for that time? Yeah. yeah. And if, so as you go on through all of those, what you're finding out that... Well, let me go to the... Imp, jump into the... Imp, that's a little bit of a difficult example. But uh, professional development. So I'm just... Uh, who is responsible? Uh, who is in charge of your professional development? Boss. The boss. Okay. So, uh, management. Uh, how so, about um, get help? Boss. Boss. So, 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 you, so what you're finding is, if you go through those examples and if you look at your own work, that management is responsible for almost everything you do within your management roles. Um, actually, Edward Deming calculated the percentage the management is responsible for everything that's going on within your work and the result versus you. Anybody wants to guess the numbers? Uh, so Deming says that about 96% of everything is depends on the management and about 4% depends on you, such as work harder, so, meaning that it's your responsibility to come on time and be there, get a good night's sleep and be focused. That's about as far. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a early today. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So when you go into about being judged, the performance evaluation is one of the. So if you're performing. Po so what, what you're coming from there, that employee can do absolutely nothing to improve the quality of his or her work. I don't know if you're aware of that. <laughs> they can affect their behaviors, can't they? Really? Excuse me? <laughs> they can sort of, um, I suppose, uh, influence things by their behaviors. Like what? <laughs> uh, you know, being good to work with, the starters, um, you know, actually coming to work and, and putting effort in. Uh, not. Right. Being, um, so whose responsibility is it that people are actually coming in and let's say that the team function in a good way, that they all are feeling good about them? Is it the people's work or is it the manager's job? <laughs> it's, their, their, it's their responsibility, but the uh, manager will do something about it. Well, let's, let's go deeper. No, I'm, I, I, uh, who assigns tasks into the role? What you do in your work? You roll a party role created by management. So, yeah. uh, who decides resources in your role? Yeah, management. The, the, the management. The uh, management. Who decides your time, the office, the the everything else? So when you're given an unfair task, and now you're asking me, smile and be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a damning example. So. Anton, to answer your question, fear comes out from insecurity within the organization of being uh, uh, treated unfairly from all kinds of dimensions. Okay? okay. So if yep. you're the CEO and uh, then you are, it is your responsibility that actually 
uh, exhibit the behaviors that you want them to exhibit. It's your job to set up the organizational conditions in which people can succeed. It's not people's job to come in and come in and on drugs and uh, <laughs> and uh, given an impossible task, pretend that they're succeeding. Okay. Um, so, uh, so it's, uh, I'm just conscious of, of the time. Um, it's, it's lovely. I'm, I'm enjoying your provocative... Uh, Suggestions and, and ideas. It's really, right. it's really great. Uh, but some some people will have to leave because they're catching trains. Okay. Uh, but but uh, and there's there's a few that are very keen to 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 hear the, your answers to some of those those questions. So I don't want to rush you on, but yeah, yeah. go ahead. So which uh, let me briefly go through all of the rest now. Uh, let's see, what were uh, some of the uh, so types of uh, organizations of hierarchies. Um, all. Um, I, I'm not fine. If you find a decent organization, they're fundamentally all. Uh, one of the results of hierarchies is, is, is that most of you and, mo and most of the students worldwide, and you in particular, you're receiving an inferior education without ever being aware. Universities, uh, government, uh, military, uh, corporate. All. Uh, how do you overcome uh, fear or him? Uh, the only way that I can uh, that you can figure out uh, f uh, fear or he is you can figure it, uh, overcome it with knowledge. And uh, internal knowledge how organizations behave so that you can structure the organization in such a way that there is no fear in it. Which is if you're the CEO, uh, a real CEO with uh, being with the shareholder. Uh, your goal is that organization innovates and achieves a greater market and achieves a greater profit share and that people actually work on the tasks that are useful to the customers. So, uh, uh, sorry, we, we can't see your screen? Oh, is there... I just put the word knowledge. Okay. Knowledge there. And it was Deming's point that, and that knowledge, regretfully, since we have become such great fear this is not being taught. So students come to class, they read the textbook, uh, it doesn't make any sense. You go on, you get your diploma, but you're actually leaving this in. And that's something that I found when I graduated with all of my degrees and I started work. Uh, what Deming claimed that in order to actually become proficient in the field, you have to work with a great master. Um, it's, he calls him a master. That un unless you're working under a master, you cannot achieve any proficiency in the field, be it a sport, a tennis player, uh, a physicist, anybody else. We've lost all of the masters today. And uh, regretfully, when you go back into your companies, you will complete, uh, continue implementing those defunct procedures that don't work. And uh, the, the, the how many of you have kids? Would you want your kids to continue in the organization as it exists today? In an organization? Like um, yeah, being in an organization in which you work today. Would you want your kids to experience it? No. Yeah. No. People are laughing, so they say no. And, and, and it's a serious issue. How do we change the world that actually the future generations don't experience what we have to come through. And it's changeable, but the only way you can overcome is really with studying it, with understanding it. And, and uh, one of those ways Ademi came up with uh, is certainly the security. I'll give you an example of uh, uh, different organizations. When organizations get into trouble, what happens? So if you have this organization and it, it reaches a financial trouble, who, who are the first people to go? Workers. The workers, yeah. So you take these people and you chop it off, right? And it's an example of a hierarchy. In a different organization, what actually happens? Uh, I don't know if you're aware. Um, I'll give you two different examples. One is I'll take it from the military, uh, US military. 
and one is I'll take it from Japanese in the 80s and if I may I can just uh, re sort of read it to you so if the company gets into trouble uh, what they do is in Japan uh, the first is they cut dividend Cut dividend. Is that, yeah. Okay. So it's a, uh, so a corporate policy. So in most corporate policies, uh, what they are trying to do is, and the goal of the boss is who next to cut. Now uh, in Japan it was different. Cut dividend, uh, and if the company is in a serious trouble, just maybe perhaps cut the entire dividend out. Second, it's a formal corporate policies. Uh, reduce salaries for top management. So reduce their salaries. Okay, of the CEOs and vice presidents. Third, if the, if it's still not enough, uh, you still further reduction. Repeat number two. Reduce uh, salaries of top management further. Fourth, everybody is asked to help out. Re uh, pay reduction for everybody. And five. Um, actually, no. Uh, uh, force is a furlough, so small pay reduction, and then it's a pay reduction for all. But nobody is fired from the organization. So the goal of to get a fear he is out is to uh, to have an organization in which ideas can sort of flow securely in the top, that you don't have a fear of being removed from the organization. Okay. Let me give you an example from the United States military, how they've dealt it. Uh, and that happened during World War II. So, uh, World War I, General Pershing. So that's, uh, I'm sure, probably. Uh, so, when General Pershing uh, came to uh, France, he was staggered at the state of the U.S. Army. And the first thing he did, uh, he relieved right away uh, two... Uh, two, three stars. Are you guys familiar with uh, co-commanders? Uh, four star generals, three star generals. So instantly he relieved uh, two co-commanders. He relieved uh, six two stars. And overall he relieved uh, 1,400 officers from the top. They went home right away. It was a, uh, called the policy of swift relief. Uh, George Marshall Uh, at the beginning of World War II, instantly relieved uh, 600 top officers from the U.S. military uh, for the deem of being incompetent. Uh, let me give you uh, General Depew uh, during Vietnam War. He would be relieving all of the top officers on the spot, uh, saying that it's a lot to relieve the incompetent officers than uh, send a letter to the mother. And so here is how he would relieve them. This is a little bit... Uh, so here, here is his uh, human uh, descriptions. And if I could just give you a few quotes. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Simpson was a fat, disheveled officer without any soldierly characteristics whatsoever, who made a bad impression on all those people whom he briefed as a representative of 1st Division. Lieutenant Colonel Dundon is completely without talent of any kind whatsoever, no initiative, no imagination, and repeatedly performed his duties in a sluggish, unintelligent manner. Lieutenant Colonel Hunt, valueless. And uh, Lieutenant Colonel Koenig did not have the character to stand up and be counted. Another one, uh, Birdside, uh, simply a weak officer. Uh, another one, he is a third-rate officer who should not be entrusted with command of soldiers in combat, um, and, and so on. Uh, so there are, there are many ways of um, dealing with them, but what you have to do if you're the CEO, uh, your goal is how do you put in and, um, and the American military policy and swift relief is over. Started with I believe President Lincoln, uh, 
is how do you put the most competent person at the top and how do you create a trusting relationship throughout your organization as it functions. Um, so this is some of the... Let me see, was there any... And the last question was, it was it was cultural? No, I don't think it's cultural. I think uh, we're in a grand mess today in the 20th, uh, 21st century uh, organizations and uh, in I, there is a... Let me give you... I'll finish it. I don't know if you're familiar with the story of Ignaz Samelweis. No. No. Uh, Ignaz Samelweis was a German, uh, I believe, Austrian uh, before the germs were discovered. And he was working with uh, mothers delivering babies. And um, the percent of mothers dying in the hospital was about 30%, one third. And uh, in, in, in poor population, what uh, women tried to do is try to give birth on the street because there was a uh, high survival uh, of the mother and the baby if she did not go into the hospital. What he figured out was that if doctors only wash their hands, that the percentage of survival of the mother went into, I think, 0.01%. Basically, they all live. And uh, what uh, happened to him uh, after this finding, he was fired and then eventually uh, commuted to a psychiatric uh, institution, beaten up and, uh, and, and, and died. And so uh, it, it seems that it's easy to change organization. Nikola Tesla similarly, uh, even if the greatest innovation came today that could keep you young forever, heal you out of, uh, from diseases and everything else, we as a humanity would not accept it because we like uh, to change our uh, affairs slowly. So the only way with our, the suggestion is we have to uh, study the knowledge seriously, implement it within our organizations and build better organizations. But when it's going to come, I'm not so sure. Okay. Sergey, fantastic. It's, it's great listening to you as always, such an interesting person. Uh, you really make us think. Um, sometimes you you stretch our minds and we think, wow, what 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 you say? How can that be true? But it's really, I think you've you've uh, you've made us all uh, think. Yeah, and we definitely will uh, a meeting tomorrow again with the students. We've got an extra class, so we'll be talking about some of the things you said and take some of that further. Uh, I, w I was wondering if if any of the students were interested in. in you and take you on on some of the things you've said would, would you be okay with that absolutely I would uh, send me an email I also wanted to say that you have very few very rare professor in in, in dr. de Waal, so I'm I'm really grateful to him very few instructors actually even open to listening uh, uh, to these types of ideas so you have something very precious going on and thank you instructor for going way outside and bringing uh, at least myself and others. So thank you, Dr. Deval. If you no, have questions, uh, <laughs> please email me if you build your businesses, if you need more knowledge, or uh, I can re reference uh, uh, some books and knowledge. If you're, if you're a vice president of a large organization, these are daily issues that you experience. So I'll, I will absolutely help you, and not just now after the class, but years after the class. That's fantastic. We, th we thank you for that. And uh, listen, um, we really appreciate it. You must at some stage come and visit Australia. I'd like to, to introduce you to the students, so we must work on work on that, okay? Have a great Australian wine. <laughs> right, yeah, absolutely. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, and Sergey, I'll, I'll catch up with you tomorrow. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you very I'll much. Go back to bed now, can you? <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.